In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgression unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil, and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us, and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. be to God on high, and on earth peace to dwell. The Lord be with you. And 
let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, give us an increase of faith, hope, and charity, and that we may obtain what you have promised, make us love what you have commanded. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The first lesson for the 13th Sunday after Trinity is written in the second book of Chronicles, chapter 28. The Israelites took captive from their kinsmen 200,000 wives, sons, and daughters. They also took a great deal of plunder, which they carried back to Samaria. But a prophet of the Lord called Oded was there, and he went out to meet the army when it returned to Samaria. He said to them, Because the Lord, the God of your fathers, was angry with Judah, he gave them into your hand. But you have slaughtered them in a rage that reaches to heaven. And now you intend to make the men and women of Judah and Jerusalem your slaves. But aren't you also guilty of sins against the Lord your God? Now listen to me. Send back your fellow countrymen you have taken as prisoners, For the Lord's fierce anger rests on you. Then some of the leaders in Ephraim, Azariah, son of Jehohanan, Berechiah, the son of Meshillamoth, Jehezkiah, son of Shalom, and Amasa, son of Hadlai, confronted those who were arriving from the war. You must not bring those prisoners here, they said, or we will be guilty before the Lord. Do you intend to add to our sin and guilt? For our guilt is already great, and his fierce anger rests on Israel. So the soldiers gave up the prisoners and plunder in the presence of the officials and all the assembly. The men designated by name took the prisoners, and from the plunder they clothed all who were naked. They provided them with clothing and sandals, food and drink, and healing balm. All those who were weak they put on donkeys, So they took them back to their fellow countrymen at Jericho, the city of Palms, and returned to Samaria. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The second lesson is written in St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 3. Brothers, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, many, meaning many people, but, and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. What I mean is this. The law, introduced 430 years later, does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on a promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. What then was the purpose of the law? Was it, added because of, it was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the prophet, promise referred had come. The law was put into effect through angels by a mediator. A mediator, however, does not re represent just one party, but God is one. Is the law, therefore, opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin, so that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to St. Luke, the 10th chapter. Glory be to you, o Lord. Then Jesus turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So, too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return I will reimburse you for any ex extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you.
Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus. Being a neighbor to someone is more than living next door to them. Even in our isolated world, we will still understand what it means if someone is being neighborly. We understand what it means to be a good neighbor. Of course, that's a lesson you could learn just about anywhere. You can learn it on Sesame Street or from Mr. Rogers. And at first glance, it seems like Jesus is teaching basically that same lesson in the gospel today. To a man who is not as good a neighbor as he should, to people who are not always good neighbors, Jesus teaches us to love our neighbor. But if we think that, then we have missed the whole point of Jesus' parable. Yes, Jesus tells us about loving our neighbors, but the whole neighbor question only comes up because of another question, the first question he asks. And that question is this, or that is asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This is not a question about civics. It's a lesson on salvation. And the single question, who is your neighbor, has answers that pertain to our salvation. On our lips, it's nothing but an excuse and condemnation. But on the lips of Jesus, it's mercy. It's pure gospel. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Even though the expert in the law was certainly misguided, it wasn't a bad question. It's at least a good concern, something that we should all be concerned about. It needs an answer. I want to go to heaven. How do I get there? And if we're going to ask anyone, Jesus would be the man to ask. Answer me, Jesus. What do I got to do? And Jesus says, you tell me. What is written in the law? How do you read it? Jesus indicates that the answer to this all-important question is not to be pulled out of thin air. It is not to come from the man's own opinion. Jesus didn't say, well, tell me, how do you feel about it? Or, or what do you think? No, he says, what is written? It's something, this thing that is written, was something that the man had probably read hundreds of times. He had it memorized. He said, this is easy. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, that's right. Do this. Do this and you will live. Now the man's next question does not come because the man is looking for instruction. He's not looking for guidance so that he would know which of his neighbors he is to love. The man, it says, wanted to justify himself. That is, he wanted to show and feel like he had fulfilled the law. And so he wanted to know how far he had to go in this loving the neighbor business. In other words, he wanted to know which people aren't my neighbors. Which people am I under no obligation to love? Because I really don't want to do more than I have to do. So for this man, who is my neighbor, is nothing but an excuse looking for a loophole. But what's even more appalling than this is is this man's presumption that that the first table of the law, love the Lord your God with all your heart, so that was no problem in his mind. So who is the neighbor that I'm supposed to love? Is it the people that I meet each day? Is it just people of my economic status, the people of my skin color, people of my rank and above or below? Is it just people of my faith or or people of my circle of friends, people I like, people who like me? I mean, there's got to be a cutoff somewhere. What about people I disagree with? What about people who rub me the wrong way, who vote the wrong way? What about people that hate me, who call me names, people who I don't even know? Do I have to love them too? Who's my neighbor? It's a question that tries to draw a line in our lives and the people in them as though God really has no business telling us how to treat people on the other side of the line. 
when we think that there are certain people, people who have behaved in sinful w- in certain ways, people who live certain kinds of lives, that we really don't need to love. That either don't deserve our love, or we don't want to give it to them. That they don't deserve our love and we don't want to give it to them, whether, whether that's because of something they did or just because of who they are. And we will use that to justify ourselves. Especially when other people are in the wrong, when they have wronged us or they have done wrong and lived a, a, a wrong kind of life. We do it to make ourselves feel better about our lives and our actions. And we think to ourselves, I mean, how can God really expect me to be patient and loving with these people? And I feel like I'm a pretty good person, so it must be them that's wrong and not me. Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan shows us that that's simply not true. And though all all along we claim, we claim to love God with all our heart and soul, mind and strength, Our who is my neighbor question just proves that love for God is thrown out the window. That's why Luther brilliantly taught us the meaning of every commandment is this. We should fear and love God. That. Every time we fail to love our neighbor, we just show what we really think of him and his commands. Oh, I love God. Everyone loves God but not enough to obey his commands. So Jesus says, do this and live. The reverse is also true. Don't do this and, well, you guessed it. If you're at least a little more honest than this expert in the law at this point, maybe you feel like you've been punched in the gut, robbed of everything that you had, left for dead on the side of the road. And maybe you should. Maybe instead of always trying to excuse ourselves and justify ourselves, we should be crying out for help. Crying out for mercy. What are the chances that someone will come along and help? The man's question to Jesus was, who is my neighbor? Jesus' answer to to that question was another question after he told a story to set the stage. But Jesus doesn't ask, who is the Samaritan's neighbor? I said at the start that this really isn't a lesson on who is your neighbor. Your neighbor is anyone who needs you. But Daniel Tiger or Mr. Rogers could have told you that. Jesus wants to get you to heaven. To eternal life. And so the question he wants to answer, Jesus asked the man, which one was a neighbor to this man? To this man who was deprived of everything he held dear, mugged and, and beat up and left for dead. He couldn't just pick himself up with sheer will and determination, set himself back on the road and go his own way. No, none of that. Instead, a Samaritan finally comes along, an unlikely source of help, considering their people's history. He dresses and puts bandages on the man's wounds. He puts him on his own animal and leads him to an inn, and he cares for him. And then when you think he's done enough for this poor man who he was under no obligation to help anyway, he sees them to the man's care and recovery, promises to pay whatever it costs. Who does that? Who treats people like that? Cares for people like that? Loves people like that? There can only be one answer to that question. And it's not you. When Jesus asks which one was a neighbor, he could just as easily be asking you, who is your neighbor? That is, who was a neighbor to you? When you find yourself under the weight of God's law, when your conscience and the commands of God run over you like a truck, burden you, trouble you, you realize that you are unable to love God with all of anything. 
And when you understand that love your neighbor actually means all of them, all the time. The answer is not to take a deep breath and try harder to be more like a good neighbor, more like Jesus. The answer is to let Jesus be a neighbor to you. To be the neighbor that we needed him to be. When Jesus asks, who is my neighbor? He's inviting you to see in his description of the Samaritan himself. He's the one they hated. His enemies even once accused him of being a Samaritan and demon-possessed. The Lutheran theologian Johann Gerhard put it this way. The true Samaritan came to us. He took on a true human nature, was beaten and wounded, so that in his divine and human nature he can cure us by his healing remedy. He soothes our wounds with the oil of the Holy Gospel, and because of our remaining sins, he uses the bitter wine of the cross. He carries us upon his shoulders, leads us into the haven of the church, and lets us be cared for and attended. And whatever is used by his servants to heal men's souls, he will richly reward upon his return. The Good Samaritan is a neighbor to you. Where the law has left you helpless and alone, he is present with you. Where you've been left beat up by guilt and shame, he applies the healing salve of absolution and binds your wounds with his word of forgiveness. You were left for dead. But to you, he applies the medicine of immortality, his holy body and blood. And where there is forgiveness of sins, there is also life and salvation. Jesus has provided the medicine and the care, but he knows that your rehabilitation and recovery will take some time, and it'll take some money. And so he also sees to your ongoing care and healing through his church, his word and sacraments. And he promises that even if some of those expenses come out of your own pocket now in the form of offerings toward his healing work or, or in the form of time and energy and service to the, to the church, that others, our children, our neighbors, might also receive our Good Samaritan's care. He promises that he's good for it. Nothing can be wasted. He'll repay everything. The same question, who is your neighbor, we use it as an excuse. It condemns us. But on the lips of Jesus, it's pure mercy. Jesus is so neighborly to us that he doesn't leave us in our sin and our foolish questions about how much we need to do. He sees us lying there and he gets down to help. He stoops down where we need him the most. And so this neighborliness that gives us gives a new meaning to Jesus' words then at the end, go and do likewise. He's not just saying, just go and do like Jesus did. Jesus is the good Samaritan. He is the good neighbor. Likewise means like he did for you. Your neighbors, all of them, are those who are likewise objects of his love. So your love and service to them is not mere duty or obligation, not just something that you have to do. It's really love. But it's his love. From your neighbor to your neighbor. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join in confessing the Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father.
please note that when we come to the distribution hymns, the first distribution hymn, the number is correct in the ordo. The number on the board is wrong. It's hymn 499, the first distribution hymn. Let us pray. For the church throughout the world, and especially this congregation, that we would not bypass those in need, but rather be filled with God's love and grace to care for all our neighbors, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the Lord of the harvest to send forth workers into his vineyard, that through their service the world would know the compassion and care of Jesus Christ, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who suffer violence and evil in this world, that God would provide safety, comfort, and healing, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who are enemies of God and his people, that by the working of word and spirit their hearts would be softened and they would be given the gifts of repentance and faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For a good harvest, protection from untimely and inclement weather, and abundant provisions for all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all governments and those in authority, that they would justly and wisely use their position and authority to promote the general welfare of us all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all the sick and the suffering, especially Jean Jesuits who suffered a stroke, that God would provide care and rest for them, and according to his will, a restoration to earthly health. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all husbands and wives, that they may live in love and faithfulness in their vocations, serving one another in love, and with thanksgiving for 71 years of marriage for Harold and Lila Jesuits, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the church triumphant and the church militant, that all who have received the inheritance of eternal life in Christ would be united forever in a holy communion and dwell in the promised land of the new heavens and new earth to come on the last day. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Into you, your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who having created all things, took on human flesh and was born of the Virgin Mary. For our sake he died on the cross and rose from the dead to put an end to death, thus fulfilling your will and gaining for you a holy people. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Almighty and most merciful Father, send down upon us the grace of your Holy Spirit, and through your Holy Word be pleased to bless and sanctify these your gifts of bread and wine, that they may be the body and the blood of your most dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, 
Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Therefore, O Lord, according to his institution, we, your servants, celebrate here before your divine majesty. With these, your holy gifts, the commemoration your Son has willed us to make, remembering his blessed passion, mighty resurrection, and glorious ascension, we give you most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits he has secured for us, and we humbly ask you to grant that by his merits and death and through faith in his blood, we and your whole church may receive forgiveness of sins and all other benefits of his passion. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this Holy Supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.